Well, good afternoon or good morning to all, and welcome to the Weber Training Teleclass, The Physics of Flying Feces. There is only one person who could conceive of a title like that, and I'll get to him in a minute. Firstly, let me say that my name is Paul Weber, and on behalf of my colleague, Dr. Saya Tatar of the University of Ottawa, we are really pleased to be able to share this time with you, and thank you very much for joining us on the teleclass today. So, Jim Gauthier. Jim is an intelligent and articulate and very imaginative fellow. Jim is an infection control professional for the Providence Continuing Care Center in Kingston, Ontario, Canada. I honestly don't think he has a television in his house because along with his work in the hospital, he is involved in infection control education at a whole bunch of different levels, including internationally, and he is really in demand as a speaker. If you have ever witnessed one of Jim's presentations, you will remember it. He uses all sorts of tools to get his message across and manages to get it stuck in your brain so that you just can't help but learn. He is even willing to sing and tap dance to facilitate learning. I'm really pleased that he's able to make this time for us. I'm also very pleased to be able to welcome Lisa Coote and her colleagues at Arjo. Arjo has generously offered to sponsor this teleclass, and not only does their sponsorship allow us to keep your registration fees low, but it also allows healthcare professionals from developing nations to get really unlimited access to all of our teleclass materials for free. So on their behalf and on yours, to everyone at Arjo, I say thank you very much indeed. Now, to prevent to present the physics of flying feces from Kingston on the beautiful shores of Lake Ontario. It is my honor to introduce a good guy and a good friend, Jim Gauthier. Jim. Thank you very much, Paul. A very eloquent introduction as usual. And hello to all my friends out there. I've had, I heard many people uh, sign on and I recognize the names and it's nice to hear so many people listening in today. Paul started to say there that we wanted to present the physics of flying feces and he almost did say prevent and ultimately that's what I'm here for is to make sure that we try to prevent some of this. So if you go to your objective page, I want to go over a few things around the physics of flying feces and try to look at this in a scientific yet at the same time lighthearted manner, uh, even though I still consider this a very serious and if not deadly serious subject that I'm talking on here today. So we're going to try to discuss what I see as feces in our healthcare settings. I take a slightly different look at a lot of different articles that I'm going to be going over here. Uh, my background is as a medical laboratory technologist, and we all tend to look at the world from a slightly different perspective for sure. And we're going to look at the issues around having organisms from feces in the environment and how it affects both patient colonization and disease transmission. And we're going to look at possible solutions. I don't want to leave everyone hanging, and I don't want to go off on a rant and just worry about things like this, but I do want to offer some suggestions too. So if we go to our next slide, I've discovered this wonderful website called dictionary.com, and uh, you can look up almost any word here. We all know what I'm talking about when I use the word feces. And again, this is the kind of a presentation that I could lapse into using a lot of slang, and we will try to keep it on the medical tilt here for sure. It is nice to know that the word's been around since the early 1400s, and that it does come from Latin meaning grounds, dregs, and sediments. And if we go to our next slide, I'm going to present you with some stuff that you probably don't really want to know. I find this is one of those subjects that most of us shy away discussing. And I've had some interesting responses to the title from people, even a cab driver that was saying, oh, that's good to know you're talking about that because I've been having issues around blah, 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 and you get this life history that you're thinking, I'm sorry, you're my cab driver. I don't need to know this. So I'll present you with some stuff that you're probably going to go, I don't need to know this, uh, such as the average person does pass between uh, 100 and 250 grams of feces per day, and that this occurs from once every two or three days, and in some patients much longer than that when we have to intervene, to our other end of the spectrum where we have patients that will present to us some fecal matter several times per day, usually at very inopportune times. And the picture here is actually a scanning electron micrograph of fecal organisms as they clump together, and you can see the variety of different shapes that are present there. Our next slide goes on to some more stuff that most of what we do past per rectum is water, which I was surprised to find. And 30% of your remaining solid that we do pass is bacteria. And the number there, 1 times 10 to the 12th, is something I tend to use in most of my 
infection control presentations to remind people that even a very, very small amount of feces in the environment can be lots of bacteria. Because if you take 1 times 10 to the 12th per gram and break that down to a microgram, which is 1 times 10 to the minus 6, you're still ending up with 1 times 10 to the 6 or a million bacteria in a microgram of feces. And you can see my puppy there is quite surprised that you would have that much lying around. If we move to our next slide, what do we do with this fecal matter that's generated on a daily basis throughout the world? Well, the evidence goes back to 26th century BC, where in areas around Pakistan and present-day India, there is evidence that there was a flush toilet in people's houses, and it was attached to a common sewer system. On the next slide, even in 15th century BC, in Crete, there's evidence of flushing toilets. And coming closer to modern day, the Roman Empire had evidence of flush toilets also, and somehow we lost this technology. And this is one of the, makes me stop and shake my head, going, how can we lose flush toilets? And it also reminds me of a Monty Python sketch. Any of you that have viewed Life of Brian, uh, they go through a big, long thing about what did the Romans done for us, and this is one of the things that comes up if they did give sanitation to the world. Somehow we lost it. So we will continue on looking at uh, people that had some effect on what we presently do with our fecal matter. John Harrington is given credit from 1596 with the basic design that we have today where water comes down, flushes the fecal matter out of the receptacle, and it disappears to be worried about by someone else. And that's what most of us tend to do. We don't really worry where it ends up. And we'll be looking at some of the issues that comes from keeping our heads in the sand that way. The next slide looks at some of the more modern-looking toilets. Modifications were made through the 1700s, and we have Albert Giblin that got a patent in 1819 for the silent valveless water waste preventer, which I'm really glad someone shortened that to toilet because I would have trouble mentioning that numerous times over. And the picture here is actually what his basic design that he patented looked like. On the next slide, I was surprised to find out that Thomas Crapper did not invent the toilet. I had always been using him in my presentations as being the father of our current flush toilet. He did do some modifications in terms of patent and that kind of thing. And the phrase crap was long in use before he came along. That's just trivia for you to play on your friends. So we look at the next slide. Uh, what is the problem that we're talking about here? And I took the poster from Flight of the Phoenix, and I've changed this, if you notice carefully, to Flight of the Feces. I've recognized now for a while that we don't handle our fecal material properly. And if we go to the next slide, we don't present our patient with a whole bunch of different options as to how they are going to get rid of their fecal material. Patients really just have a few choices. They can use the toilet in the room. And in many of our hospitals, probably most of you have patient rooms, be it in acute care or long-term care, where they share a toilet with someone else. We provide them with a commode for the mobility impaired to use at bedside. And again, this may be shared as much as we like to think that won't happen or that the commode chair is cleaned diligently between uses. I think most of us can admit to some horror stories where we find that commode chairs will be used between patients, commode chairs will move between rooms. I have stories told to me where commode chairs actually move between floors without being cleaned properly. And this is talking about the overall structure of the commode chair. Well, we generally clean the bucket. We would not put a patient down over top of a dirty receptacle, but the arms, the seat, the under the seat area in many cases isn't being cleaned properly. Now, we also have the bedpan, and that leads to huge issues as to what we do after there is something in the bedpan and where do we store them. And in many facilities, our bedpans are not single use. Bedpans are used numerous times. They're rinsed out uh, and then put back into washroom, into brackets. They are put into bedside tables. They're hidden in numerous places that I probably don't want to know about. If we go to our next slide, we also allow our patient a choice of using an incontinent product if that is what is required. And again, I've just used a lot of these pictures here without talking about any specific brand. I was just searching through Google looking for some of these devices. So we've got briefs that we can put patients into, and I'll be talking about these further in terms of the physics of what we do with these things. Some patients are just incontinent in the bed. The intensive care unit that I have done infection control around, most patients were placed on an absorbent pad. We didn't try to contain the feces other than doing that with them, and it worked well enough from the perspective of we contained the feces to a smaller area, but I think still there was issues around how we handled it. On our next slide, I have an elegant description that I found about sluice rooms, which is much more of a British term, and they discuss a sluice room having either a slop hopper, or what we would refer to as a hopper in North America, or a utensil washer disinfector. 
And they go on to, again, very elegantly, I thought, discuss what a hopper looks like being a cross between a sink and a conventional toilet. And it works much like a cistern toilet. And he states in this article that it is not an ideal way of dealing with human waste disposal. Yet again, I wish I could see hands and say how many people have hoppers in their facility to dispose of human waste. And people present in the room, I instantly have hands go up. And this article, in terms of planning hospitals and stuff like that, went on to state that it should only be used as a backup to the automated equipment. We shouldn't be dumping things into hoppers. On the next page, I've got a couple of pictures taken from my facility that I actually work at of our hoppers. I love the first picture with the paper towels right next to it, and I haven't got the nerve up yet to exactly ask what they're there for. I know what they're there for, probably to wipe things up, but I'm just hoping nobody's actually washing their hands on these things. I know that's not happening. The next page down, if we look at a picture of the hopper here, we know that there is dispersal of bacteria around these sinks. The two references that I've given there were both abstracts from the American group looking at the spread of both Clostridium difficile and VRE. The picture on the right is a bedpan that was inoculated with a fluorescent powder given to a nurse, asked them to flush it. They then turned out the lights, put on the black light, and all the glowing stuff you can see is what had splashed out of the bedpan. So it's up the back of the wall, it's on the wall, it was actually on the front of the person that did the flushing. And it's just not a nice way of getting rid of feces. The household studies done by Dr. Gerba back in 1975 also showed that aerosols in artificially inoculated toilets persist for hours in the air. His recommendation, obviously, is to keep the toilet lid down when you flush. And if you look at the hopper on the right there, I don't see a toilet lid that we could actually put down. The other bedpan washing, which again is quite common in many hospitals that I'm familiar with, is the pipe or the wand on the back of the toilet. I have tried to use one of these once and succeeded in splashing myself terribly, and they're still in general use. If you haven't tried one of these, do one day to see how difficult it is to use these properly. And again, these only rinse the pan. They are not affecting any kind of a disinfection. They're not affecting any kind of a sanitizing step either, for that matter. It's basically just a rinse that you would dump into the toilet and then have to do something else with the bedpan. So I've talked about the issues around our feces. We've got patients that are producing feces in our environment. We've got some ways of doing something with it. And I want to look at the hospital pathogens that sort of concern me. Where I'm going to focus here is on VRE and on Clostridium difficile. And I'm not going to go into detail on the whole background of the bugs themselves. Paul's done many teleconferences on these organisms. In a nutshell, VRE, you know, it's not a huge pathogen as such. The enterococci luckily don't cause a lot of morbidity. Urinary tract infections, we do see it as wound infections. When patients pick up VRE, we have that percentage still. Only about 2% of patients are actually getting infected. Lives in the environment, very hardy organism. The five to seven days is a, a no problem kind of thing. And I've got another slide coming up where we look at some of the survival of these organisms. And it is reasonably easy to kill with hospital-grade disinfectants. It is, after all, a vegetative bacteria. The next slide goes on to talk about Clostridium difficile. And if we look at Clostridium as an organism, it is built to survive in the environment because of the spore that it contains. And this allows, at the spore stage, for the organism to survive and it makes it resistant to our hospital-grade disinfectants. I put down most hospital-grade disinfectants, and again, the more I read on this, I really think the spore is resistant to our hospital-grade disinfectants, uh, what we would normally use in our cleaning and disinfection of the environment. The vegetative bacteria are the ones that we can aim at trying to kill in the environment. The problem is, is why we're trying to kill them, they are sporulating. So if we're using something that doesn't kill effectively, we end up with the spores actually forming while we're trying to take care of the organism. Other things that will cause the vegetative bacteria to sporulate are things such as the drying, the antibiotics, the temperature changes. And the vegetative cells are easy to kill, just a time factor. And there's some studies done where they actually look at how disinfectants cause the bacteria to sporulate. If we move on to our next slide. Other fecal fellows, as I refer to them, are the gram-negative bacteria. A lot of the organisms that we in the microbiology lab have to get rid of to find out if there's pathogens there are the bacteria that are listed here. And when I start seeing these names in patient specimens, again with the microbiology background, to me I always think feces. So an E. coli urinary tract infection is probably E. coli from the rectum getting where it doesn't belong and causing a urinary tract infection. Klebsiella pneumoniae, the Enterobacter, the Citrobacter, the Proteus, the Providencia, the Serratia are all organisms that you can find in feces. All aren't truly coliform organisms by definition because coliform organisms generally ferment lactose and that goes off on another tangent that I won't touch on, but they are all gram-negative bacteria. The next slide looks at what we recognize as traditional pathogens 
And there I did manage to use the word poop, uh, but luckily I kept it till about slide 20. We're looking at things listed here, your Salmonella, your Shigella, your Yersinia, E. coli 0157, Campylobacter, Aeromonas vibrio, and as a virus, Hepatitis A. These are the pathogens that we would look for in feces. Hepatitis A itself won't cause diarrhea. It goes on to cause the inflammation of the liver, the jaundice, that kind of thing. But this is where when we start seeing hepatitis A, we have to think that there's feces present. So we move on to the next slide. Uh, Kramer did a, a study that I found online, and there's a reference on my last three slides here. I have references with the URL for this article. And they looked at a bunch of different articles and sort of summarized the articles into how long the bacteria survive. Organisms like your Staphylococcus, your Strep pyogenes, which is group A strep, can survive for months on dry surfaces. The Enterococcus of Staphylococcus, again, with my microbiology background, I would usually say two to three weeks maybe in the environment. But this article summarized it as being months, uh, which made me raise my eyebrows. Your gram-negative bacteria, B. coli, serratia, Klebs, Shigella, again, months in the environment. Studium difficile, we know survives months, again, due to the spore. The enteric viruses surprised me also. I know they're hardy, especially our rotavirus, hepatitis A, polio. The summary of the articles indicated that these things can survive in the environment for up to two months, which is long, long periods of time, as far as I'm concerned, for a virus to actually survive. If we move on to our next slide, I want to start looking now at what I feel is evidence of feces being handled poorly in our healthcare setting. So I'm going to start with hepatitis A, and there was an article from Dobling back in 1993 where they looked at an outbreak of hepatitis A. 11 of the 154 healthcare workers got hepatitis A, and they traced it back to two burn victims, a father and an infant. All of the people that had it had contact with the source infant. Eight out of the 11 had contact with the father. The article went on to summarize the problems that they saw was poor hand hygiene and eating food on wards and that there must have been some contamination in the environment. We'll look at some other examples here. If you go to the next slide, if we look for transmission of vancomycin-resistant enterococci, Martinez did a study in 2003 or published a paper where they went into a room after routine cleaning and found in, out of 10 rooms, two of them still had surfaces where they could find detectable VRE. In the one room where it was found was on the light switch, the toilet flusher, the telephone, and the bathroom faucet. With it being present on the light switch, this is after a terminal clean. I can then see the scenario of a nurse entering the room, flipping on the light, and transmitting the organism then into the patient's environment. And this could explain how if we haven't cleaned a room properly, patients end up with things like VRE, MRSA, even Clostridium difficile, where they may not have had direct contact with a patient. I remember there was a period of time when I was working at an acute care hospital where we did try to tr keep track of who went into a patient bed space to see if there was some transmission happening that way. And unfortunately, just with the amount of other things happening, I don't think we ever followed that up to show that the bed space was the cause. Generally, we could show that sharing space with a patient was part of the transmission problem, but not necessarily following a patient into a bed, whereas this article is showing how that very easily could have happened. So we go to the next slide. They took a look at a rehabilitation facility, TRIC, in 2002. And when they went through the rehabilitation facility, 15% of the surface sampled had VRE. And it was generally related to the patient colonization status. But again, just showing that this organism, which is normally only present in feces, was being found throughout the environment. If we go on to the next slide, Zachary did a wonderful study where they did a structured physical exam of VRE positive patients. And they asked the doctors to go in, take a listen to the chest, palpate the back, abdomen, and lower extremities. And lo and behold, they could find the bacteria on the doctors. And the next slide summarizes where they could find it. Basically, 67% of the time when they checked, they could find VRE. And it was present on what you would expect, the gowns, the gloves, stethoscopes. And in 24% of the cases, all three of those areas were contaminated with VRE. And this paper helps support the whole concept of using contact precautions in a patient's room where you know that they have something, but it begs the question of what we're doing in patients' rooms when they are colonized but unrecognized. The presence of an ileostomy and colostomy were obviously linked to the contamination, which is being linked to the amount of feces that we may be getting into the patient's bed space that won't be going into a washroom. 
And the nice thing from that article that I put on here is the last bullet is when they took a look at the stethoscopes after being wiped with an alcohol pledge, uh, that took care of the VRE in all cases. And they were suggesting that this just becomes a routine when you come out of a patient's room. I think they were referring to the VRE that you take your alcohol pledge it, give your bell of your stethoscope a wipe off just to take care of anything that you might have picked up. And again, you have to remember this here, they were just listening to the chest and palpating the abdomen. So the feces was being picked up through the chest area. And again, I know the ileostomy and colostomy were related to that. If we look at the next slide, am I worried just about the patients? Well, no. There's a picture of my lovely family uh, last year at Easter. Barron did a study looking at the presence of VRE in healthcare workers who have worked with patients who had VRE. And then they also obtained rectal swabs on family members and found that there was the same VRE present in the healthcare worker and in their family. So there was some transmission happening in the home. Now, I've always recognized and I've always talked to people that we all tend to share the same bugs in our household, and I'm not too concerned about that. When we start talking about fecal organisms, maybe I have to rethink this a bit. So is it just incontinent patients? On the next slide, they took 14 colonized BRE patients, that's the CBRE, who were continent and set up a mock examination. This is a study by Grabsk in 2006. So after doing the mock exam with these known colonized continent patients, they found their chair cultures were positive anywhere between 36 to 58% of the time. The couch cultures were positive, and they don't give a definition of what the couch is, whether this is an examination kind of couch or whether it was something, that, again, in part of the examination room. But they were finding colonization of these surfaces where patients had sat who were colonized and continent. I'll keep emphasizing that. If we go to the next slide, they were finding that gowns were positive after these mock exams. Again, we were seeing transmission to the healthcare workers' gowns. And the article summarized quite nicely what I've always had a concern about is that the infection control measure should focus on effective healthcare worker and patient hand hygiene, that the chairs and couches should be cleaned. They didn't go into any kind of a frequency. But again, if you go into your facility and check in common waiting room areas, how often the chairs are actually cleaned, and I think you would be appalled at the lack of cleaning that goes on in many healthcare facilities. So if we go on to the next slide. I've got a summary as to how this might be possible, and I found this wonderful picture. I actually had a better picture than this, but unfortunately couldn't find the reference for it after I had found it the first time. I could never pick it up again. I don't know if it had been removed off of Google Images, which is where I get most of my stuff here. But I'm querying in a continent colonized patient, is it the contamination of the clothing from when it drops down in front of the toilet? Or is it due to patient poor hand hygiene where we clean ourselves after a bowel movement, we then pull up our trousers or uh, slacks, and are we then contaminating them to an extent that we can transmit the VRE into the environment? This was a very interesting article to work through. It'll certainly give you something to think about next time you're sitting in very public areas on couches and then considering going off to have something to eat. The focus for me, I'm making a lot of people nervous in the room here, the focus for me is our hand hygiene. If you don't take it from anywhere else on your hand, we're fine. But let's go on to the next slide. Where else do we find them? Garcia did a nice article, a very extensive review, looking at healthcare pneumonia and was relating it back to the change in flora that we see in patients. And I read this article with a slightly different looking eye. The first statement that I found in here was a gastric colonization where they found gram-negative bacilli, those organisms that come from the feces, starting to colonize the gastric area, which would be the stomach area and down. He went on to look at how the upper respiratory tract becomes colonized. And there's a very elegant discussion of how we have streptococci in our mouth it is there, it's sort of blocking any kind of receptor for other things to come in. We go into hospital through inflammation or drying, the fibronectin that's there will decrease, allowing other organisms to overgrow. And usually the first organism that we find is our gram-negative bacilli. Now, if we go to the next slide, he was looking in one ICU and took a look at what was happening. The patients, 60% of the patients were colonized with gram-negative microorganisms and other organisms, but after five days, and 85% of these patients were now colonized by the 10th day. Invented patients, we were detecting them to be heavily colonized by gram-negative organisms, and again, think feces, and this was occurring in as little as 24 hours after intubation. And the swabs being done here were of the oral cavity to see this colonization happening. So that article itself made me start thinking, well, gram-negative are present in very low numbers in the oral cavity, and I can see an overgrowth issue. But for the amount of organisms that were showing up, again, I'm starting to think feces. And I'll get back to that. 
If we go on to the next slide and we start looking at Clostridium difficile, I've been focusing a little bit here on the VRE. We've looked at some gram-negative bacteria. But even with Clostridium difficile, we know as early as 1980 that they were finding that our hands and other fecally contaminated items would have C. difficile present. The faculty did this study where they were looking at what the infective dose was using hamsters to infect them. And again, this is back in 1980. Uh, when I came out of lab school, C. difficile was not really being talked about when I was in my first provincial lab that I was working in in Calgary. We were just starting to get to the point where we were growing Clostridium difficile and utilizing that as detection. For the long while, it was just considered a bug that you would find every once in a while in the feces if you used the right media. So they were looking back in 1980 as what this bug was and what it was doing in terms of causing diarrhea in the presence of antibiotics and found a very low infective dose in hamsters if there was antibiotics present. They found that a fairly high dose of 1,000 colony forming units orally did not colonize nor did it infect unchallenged hamsters, meaning they had a normal intact gut and the organism would not hang around to colonize, nor would it actually cause diarrhea if they were not exposed to antibiotics. Through the study, they were looking at the relationship with lactobacilli and other gut flora, seeing if there was some sort of a relationship back and forth, and they didn't come to any conclusions then in 1980 on this stuff. I've changed my title up here. I don't know if you noticed to what were we seeing as opposed to what are we seeing. Because the article I just talked about was 1980. If we go to the next slide here, I'm looking at an article that was in the Clinical Microbiology Newsletter. was talking about Clostridium difficile as being an important nosocomial pathogen for the 1990s. And here I am in 2006 talking about it, and it is now one of the leading causes of diarrhea. They made the statement in the paper that there's increased vigilance against this organism be considered in most hospitals, that we had to start paying attention to it. Cart Mill uh, in 1994 was looking at Clostridium difficile and the issue around cleaning. And he was indicating that deep cleaning was used to break the cycle of the fecal oral spread. And what they had to do actually to stop one of their outbreaks was to empty out the entire ward and do a deep cleaning where every single surface was cleaned to take care of removing, as opposed to killing, the presence of these spores that were in his environment. On the next slide, we're still seeing evidence that Clostridium difficile is present in our environment. Floor contamination, especially in our washrooms, our sluice rooms. There was some movement by feet being hypothesized, and that we were finding a lot of it in our geriatric areas in the hospital when the study looked at the different areas where we were seeing it. I've always got a tendency to tell people that, you know, the floor is, to me, is not a high risk of transmission unless something hits the floor and then comes back up into the patient area. To which one day I had one of my nurses in my complex continuing care saying, oh, so when the patient drops the remote control for the TV set on the floor and I pick it up and put it back in their environment, I should probably wipe it off? And yeah, 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 that sounded like a good idea to me. So let's go to my next slide here and let's be politically incorrect. For the longest while, I've been having concerns that we have been couching our terms nicely, that the patients are becoming colonized, a change in the flora. And they've been exposed to feces in many cases. When we see the change in oral flora from gram-positive to gram-negative, they don't go on to state that perhaps this was coming from the patient's own rectum as we cleaned poorly in the environment. They just state that it shows up. The last bullet there, I still feel most nosocomial cases of VRE and C. difficile indicate that the patient has ingested feces. And this gets back to the concept of a fecal oral spread that was mentioned in Cartmill's article that I referenced earlier about the deep cleaning that needed to go on. He also went on to state that their outbreak that they looked at when he did this research on it cost them about 75,000 pounds to stop the outbreak over a six-month period that they went to. And that's in 1994 pounds. I'm sure it would cost a lot more nowadays in terms of trying to stop the transmission that we were seeing. In preparation for this presentation, looking at my second bullet here again about patient ingesting feces, is that too strongly stated? I'm still torn on that. I know we are now seeing some evidence of transmission through food. There's other places that this may be coming from, but in many cases when we're seeing an outbreak where there's rapid transmission and patients showing up with it, we are spreading feces in a way that the patient is able to get it into themselves through fecal oral transmission. So let's go on to my next slide and look at some of my suggestions as to what we need to do. And a lot of focus is coming back to is cleaning and disinfection, and we need to clean better. The new technologies that are coming out, I'm trying to get myself up on speed as much as possible, especially with the microfiber systems that's being touted by most of our sales reps that sell any kind of a cleaning product, that the microfiber cleans better. 
single dip methods. For those of you that are unfamiliar with that, this is where you would have a bucket of disinfectant into which you take a cloth, dip it into the bucket to saturate your cloth, wipe down a surface, and then you get rid of the cloth. It never goes back into the disinfectant after it's touched another surface. You would take a new cloth, dip it into the disinfectant, wipe down a new part of the room. You can turn the cloth many times as you refold them, but the cloth is never put back into the disinfectant. Numerous studies out there to show that as you dip back into your bucket of disinfectant, you soon overcome the killing capability of the disinfectant, and you then eventually start spreading the organism. We need to clean better from the sense that we need to remove dirt, organisms, and spores, and not focus so much on killing organisms. We can't kill spores. We really have to get our heads back to the concept that dirt is not good in a hospital. It's just not good, from my perspective, to be able to find dust in my patient's environment. In terms of cleaning effectively, there's the three studies listed there looking at how we can make our housekeeping better. We need to have well-trained staff, a training program done by a trainer. In many cases, the person, the new person assigned to the housekeeper is taught by that housekeeper and learns their methods. And the housekeeper who's teaching them was taught by another housekeeper who was taught by another housekeeper. And we tend to get everyone's bad habits in here unless we have a very structured training program. And we need ways of checking the work. Dr. Alpha, in her presentation, I think it was just earlier this year when she was looking at Clostridium difficile, had lovely pictures. If you're a subscriber to this whole series of the Weber teleclasses, you can go back and listen to her presentation and see the slides where they were using a fluorescent marker on toilet seats and stuff like that, and they could grade the cleaning effectiveness of the housekeeper in the area and then modify cleaning techniques if they were finding that there was a problem. If we go to the next slide, we, we know disinfecting is not as important as effective cleaning. And we've got, I found a reference to actually state that. It's, it's instinctual to us, I think, that we really have to clean well and not worry so much about the disinfecting. One of my big bugbears for years now has been that we've just cut housekeeping too far in many institutions. I know when budget crunch time comes, traditionally, housekeeping is one of the areas that takes the biggest hit. Or we've been privatizing our health care. I found the reference about Florence Nightingale uh, from the Dancer article there from 1999, where she was talking in the 1850s that a clean hospital is a healthy hospital and that it wasn't good to have dirt on the floor, that when they started cleaning up the hospital floors, the infection rate tended to go down. There is also a movement afoot now in many parts. I was going to state in, the, uh, in Britain, uh, but I know it's happening throughout the world. Whereas we've gone to contract services, many times there's this dip in the quality of our cleaning until we get things worked out as to what is expected from a hospital team. I've always challenged friends of mine, and unfortunately I've never actually sat down and done this myself, but I really think we need to look at our VRE colonization and infection rates, our Clostridium difficile and both colonizing and infection rates, and plot that versus our paid housekeeping hours and go back and look at this over five, ten years and see if we can see any kind of a pattern where as the housekeeping hours got cut and the paid hours come down, do our infection rates tend to go up? It's a hypothesis of mine that we will see a direct relationship between those. So if we go on, I've got issues around the soiling of the patient's environment. And again, being a microbiology tech, I come from this world where you could not touch anything in a laboratory without a policy and procedure and quality control. If I was to work up an organism identification, it was always a step-by-step, -step, do this, do this, touch this, incubate this, add this, this is the end result. And almost anyone could walk into a microbiology lab, follow the recipe, and do a half-hearted identification of an organism. You may not fully understand what had happened. Uh, it helps to have trained technologists doing this, but I'm used to having procedures written step-by-step-by-step. -by -step -by -step. And I've done this to industry as to, I was at a conference and there was a, um, a couple of representatives who sold incontinent products and I asked the representatives, could you give me a written procedure on how to change a patient who has a set of briefs that are full of feces? And there's the dead silence and the stunned look of, oh my God, who is this man? And they said, would that be handy to have? And I said, well, as a lab tech, the only diaper I've ever changed is my children. And yes, I got feces on my hand changing my children's diapers and with my background, I knew how to keep clean, dirty. And they were a lot easier to work with when they're 10 to 15 pounds. I can't imagine doing this on someone who is 230 pounds and demented with diarrhea. And how do you do it? I really still not have had a good explanation from someone how you get a patient out of a pair of briefs and get them back into a new pair of briefs without getting feces all over the place, uh, especially if the briefs have leaked. Do we change the bed first or do we change the briefs first? Do you change the briefs with them still in a fecally soiled bed or 
I just haven't got my head wrapped around this, and I really don't want to know deep down, which is too sad. I need to go up and actually do this. And then we get to changing a bit. When we have an unconscious, vented patient that has defecated in bed uh, that requires two nurses to move, how many times do you change your gloves through this whole procedure of cleaning the patient, changing the bed, from dirty sheets to clean sheets? Because I know we can change beds with patients in that. I give nurses full credit for being able to do this. How many times do we change your gloves? Whereabouts do you actually wash your hands? And I've never seen a written step-by-step, step one, put on gloves, step two, do this, as to how we change a patient. And I bet you most of the nurses here were taught by their nurse mentor when they came through to do their clinical rotation, who was taught by and who was taught by and who was taught by. The how we handle bedpans, I've got this vision in my head that I need to take a bedpan one day, cover it with red finger paint, and put it on a bed and say to a nurse, okay, that's a bedpan full of feces. Show me what you do with this. So that they can visually see with, as they pick it up, they're going to have red finger paint all over their gloves. What they have to do, and I bet you they would handle it totally different than when they just have a hunk of feces sitting inside this bedpan with nothing visible on the outside of the bedpan. I had actually challenged one of our sponsors today to come up with a step-by-step-by-step how to put a patient on a bedpan and take them off again. I could not find that in any of my nursing practice stuff. I was amazed to find that there are patients that develop a vacuum lock on their bedpan that you literally have to stick your thumb between the patient's behind and the bedpan to break that airlock so that you can get the bedpan out. That, to me, was never a concept that that would happen. And again, I got a lot of nodding heads going, yeah, that happens. The handling of commode chairs makes most of us in infection control nervous and worried, yet we don't have a good recommendation as to what needs to be done to these chairs between patients. Dr. Alpha is working on a study right now where they're looking at what can be done and does it limit the transmission of C. difficile, and I'm hoping to see some results coming from her very soon on what she has discovered. One of the things that she's working with is some form of a pop-up disinfectant wipe that can be used between patients, and uh, what kind of success they're having with that, again, I'm very interested in seeing. So we go to the next slide titled The Environment. It was easy for me to say all this kind of stuff. I do recognize that we live in a buggy world. All I'm asking for is clean equipment being contacted by clean hands. And I'm just trying to limit the movement of those who soil my environment. The obvious soiling that we have going on, a patient with uncontrolled diarrhea should not be wandering the halls of any facility, regardless of what's present in their diarrhea. I don't care if they're VRE negative and C. difficile negative and somebody happened to look for MRSA and it's not there. They're still soiling the environment with huge quantities of bacteria and they shouldn't be moving around. Now, I will make some suggestions here in my remaining few minutes. And some of this is already working its way through our entire healthcare system. The first one being any new hospital construction or renovation, we need to have single rooms. I think any new hospital construction or renovation has to have some way of getting rid of fecal waste better than a hopper. There are the thermal flusher and disinfector systems, there are the macerators, something that is going to handle the feces and get rid of it in a way that we're not soiling the environment. A concept that I've been discussing for a while is an incontinent room where patients are moved to or placed in if they are incontinent and in that room is something that will do something to the bedpan be it the thermal flusher disinfector or a macerator. If the patient's continent, they go into a room that has its own private bathroom. Um, I've also seen pictures for ensuite concepts where the patient's bathroom has both a toilet and a flusher disinfector so that if the patient's got a bedpan, it's there. If the patient's using the toilet, it's there. But again, it's the toilet per patient. I don't mind sharing the toilet at home with uh, family and friends like this, but I do have trouble sharing it that way with strangers. Public restrooms, I'm like most of you, where you're flushing with toes and being very careful not to touch any other surface in the room. The multi-use washrooms is what I've described, where you could have a room that would be used for both continent and incontinent patients. More suggestions on the next slide is obviously the focus that we need to do on our staff and our visitors' hands. We're still working on that. Here we are in 2006, and we're still getting our compliance up to 50%, and we're really happy uh, with our hand hygiene. The other thing, though, that we tend to miss a lot, and I'm as guilty of this as some of us might be, is how well we clean our patients' hands, especially after they've used a commode chair, and how difficult we make it for patients to wash their hands. And I had this revelation one day where I realized that out of a 450-bed hospital that I was uh, on staff with, Probably 300 of those patients had a hard time washing their hands before meals because we just did not make it easy 
Long gone are the days of coming around with a basin and soap and water before meals to clean the patient up. I don't think that happens before every single meal. There's a lot of staffing issues around doing something like that. In many of our long-term care facilities, we now have our residents line up as they go into the common eating areas and they receive a dollop of hand sanitizer, the alcohol product, onto their hands. And I've been told that in many cases, even your most severely demented adults gets into the routine of doing that and will hold out their hand as they walk into the eating area. Um, they just know that's part of the procedure and they walk, rub their hands together and they go in and they have their meal. So we're cutting down on that kind of transmission where if their hands are soiled, they break the chain there. We need to do more education and more looking at our food link. There was some speculation in 1991 that we were spreading organisms through food. We were even looking at hospital food back in 1971 to see how much gram negative was present in our hospital kitchen. And again, not saying that's necessarily coming from human feces. It could be many factors involved with finding gram negative in a kitchen in 1971. But there was just a recent article, and I don't know if it's come to publication in the time that I looked this up on the internet here, where we have found Clostridium difficile in sausages, ground beef, ground veal, and ground turkey. And this is obviously concerning me and other infection control professionals if we are starting to colonize healthy people with Clostridium difficile and then expose them to antibiotics or chemotherapeutic agents. We're going to be starting to see a lot more what I would then have to call community-acquired Clostridium difficile. That's always a given that patients may be colonizing themselves this way. This probably would not lead to the outbreak situation where we see, where Clostridium difficile or VRE moves its way through a facility. That still, to me, is because we're not handling the feces well. So my summing up slide here, and I think I've got a couple of these. Yes, I do have a fecal fascination. It's not something that I really want to be, to be known for. I don't mind the bug man moniker, but I don't want any other names coming up as I wander the hallways. But I just have a problem with the way we handle feces because I don't think it's right to feed it to patients. And we're not doing it by any malice, and I'm not pointing fingers at anyone at all. We just need to handle human waste better than our great-great-great-grandparents did. And nothing much has changed since the toilet was developed to the modern standard that we see now in the 1500s. There are newer products out there, and we need to look at better ways of handling waste, especially when patients are using bedpans and commode chairs. We go to my next slide. It's actually a question slide, but I've got a couple of things that I wanted to add into here that have come up. It was Paul that was talking to me earlier in the week about some stuff that we're now seeing in Canada. We have another Clostridium difficile outbreak in a long-term care facility in Quebec where they're doing an investigation on it. And again, finding that we need to clean the environment a little bit better. And I was looking at some of the costs of outbreaks. When we have these outbreaks that rip through buildings, and I'll give you um, as much of the information as I can here, or I can present it to Paul when we're done, and he can post it on the website. There was a VRE outbreak in Australia uh, that was talked about by Pearman in the Journal of Hospital Infection, and uh, from his 2006 article that came out, uh, volume 63, pages 14 to 26, they looked at a six-month outbreak of VRE that went through a facility, and it cost a million pounds I think it was actually 2.7 Australian dollars to stop this outbreak. To me, that's a lot of money that could have been spent on housekeepers and prevention instead of having to spend it after you've got the problem. There was an outbreak in a long-term care facility that was talked about in 1999, and I'll provide Paul with these references. It would be much quicker to do it that way. And this was only five residents that picked up VRE. They stomped on it in the healthcare facility. It cost them $12,000 to stop it. They did a bunch of swabbing, found out where it was, increase their isolation precautions and stuff around patients that they knew, knew were colonized. Some of the costs that we instinctually know are there. When we look at an article that was published by Pepin in the Canadian Medical Association Journal, they found in the problem that they had in Quebec with this hypervirulent strain of Clostridium difficile that 23% of the patients that picked up the organism died. And that kind of stuff you can't put a dollar value on when we're having patients die of acquiring the organism in our facilities. I've talked about some of the answers that we can look at here. I think the bottom line that I want to get back to is we need to clean better and more effectively in our environment so that we do not spread feces around. The hands will carry it from room to room. Poor glove use will carry it from rooms to rooms. I have facetiously, I think it was on the APIC list in one of my rants that I do on there, stated that I'm real tempted to get back to recommending to nurses that we do not wear gloves to empty bedpans. 
as we used to do not that many years ago, to tell you the truth, because I am sure you can't find a nurse that would handle a bedpan with bare hands that would not wash their hands immediately afterwards. My problem is now we tend to wear gloves and touch things without being aware that we're touching them uh, once we have the gloves on. And the education that we've done through the past 15 to 20 years on standard precautions or routine practices, on glove use for any potential contact, we have to be very, very clear as to when you take those gloves off so that you do not soil the environment because it's very, very easy to do. I still think we need to use a marker of gram-negative organisms showing up where they really, truly don't hang out as normal flora as a marker for fecal transmission in our healthcare facility and use that to start looking at problems that we might have be it splashes and contamination in our hopper rooms that get carried into other parts of the hospital, through buildings that were designed 100 years ago that are handling way more patients than they were ever met for and have not been able to keep up with an infrastructure. This gets back to any new design. I think we need to get to the all single rooms, which is a recommendation from the American Institute of Architects uh, for hospitals. And the studies that I've seen where they've set up wards like this, where all patients are in single rooms, staff morale goes up, infection rate goes down. And I think we're starting to see the evidence that things are there. So, Paul, I think in the 10 minutes or so that we've got left, I could entertain some questions. Thank you very much, Jim. That is another classic Jim Gauthier teleclass, all at once informative, educational, and frightening. Thank you very much. On one of your slides on hoppers, Chuck Gerba's study there, you mentioned on aerosolization. Is that meant to say that the fecal organisms will stay aerosolized, i.e. suspended in the air, or that they will simply spread and stay viable for hours after a flush? Both. Uh, What his article looked at, uh, they use microorganisms, and I believe it was both bacteria and viruses that he utilized to um, seed the toilets. But they were finding the aerosol cloud that was generated from a flush toilet would hang suspended for between two and four hours and would go at least six feet from the toilet. I mean, they did a bunch of studies have been done around looking at how far, actually not a lot. There's about three studies that have been looking at how far toilets splash when they flush. What his recommendations in the articles were, and actually his article has been condensed a couple of times into Reader's Digest articles. It's quite funny to read in there because when they interview him directly and then use quotes from the articles, he's always saying, you know, if somebody in your household has a viral gastroenteritis, they've got rippering diarrhea going on, you want to make sure a couple of things. Your toilet seat is down when you flush. If you have a vent fan in the room, you turn that on to create a bit of a negative pressure and exhaust it out of the room. And you want to make sure your toothbrush is six feet away from the toilet. Now, when I use that example in a lot of my presentations, especially when I'm traveling, it's amazing the number of people that come up to me next day in the hotel saying, I measured. It's way too close uh, in hotel washrooms. And again, I think well, you know, it gets back to you know, your own bugs. Don't worry about your own bugs. If it's other people's bugs, worry about it. It's a good question around the flushing of toilets. Now, these are the old-fashioned toilets, because this study was done in 1975 when we we were allowed to flush our toilets with more than four liters of water. Uh, And I know the United States now, the plumbing laws is you have to use low-flush toilets, uh, which is probably good from the aerosolization perspective. At the same time, most people have to flush three or four times to affect a good flush. There's also studies out there to show the log reduction in organisms by flush, because really... The number of organisms is decreased by each subsequent flush, but it's by nowhere the water that comes into the toilet I would ever consider drinking. My dog might, uh, but it's not something that I'm actually going to look at doing because I know the bacteria are not removed. It's definitely lowered in number and it probably smells better, but it's not anywhere close to what I would even consider as being clean. So when you look at what's happening with that study from toilets and then you look at a rim flushing sink or a hopper, I've never seen one of those designed with a lid on it. So we know that as we uh, splash the bedpan all over the sides of the hopper and then hit the handle and it flushes and it does this big gagoog, that we're probably generating an aerosol. And if you've got a norovirus problem going through your facility, I would hope your staff would have face protection on, something to cover their nose, eyes, and mouth so that they're not being sprayed with it. And that when they get out of the room, they hose themselves down. That's a scary thing to think of. And you think of some of those toilets in a public area that do not have a tank. They're just a flush valve and they don't have a lid. They're just a horseshoe shaped rubber black seat that you sit on and the water comes out of there with tremendous force. It's an interesting area to to start reading articles on, especially when I'm finding articles about school toilets. And I won't go into that at all other than to say the one study they looked at, about 80% of children refused to have a bowel movement at school because of the conditions of the washroom. I've seen rectal tubes used for ventilated patients and they seem quite effective at controlling diarrhea. Uh, That's, of course, for severe diarrhea. 
um, but it seemed to work quite well. Have you seen those before? Yes, I have seen those in use. I, I'm not sure from a nursing and a medical perspective the efficacy of them. More from a perspective, do they cause problems to the rectum itself if the patient moves from this kind of stuff? But I, I know they were very effective at keeping the stool to a reasonably contained area, especially if it's liquid enough to flow into a bag. The issue then still is around how do you change the bags? Where do those get emptied? Do they have to be emptied? Or are they sealed and uh, chucked out as a biohazardous waste? Even though the patient's immediate environment may not be covered, we have to be careful whoever takes that tube apart, put on a new drainage system, recognizes that their gloves are horrendously contaminated at that time. Yes, they do limit it, but in terms of stopping the spread of species in the environment, it probably drops it down if people using them are very meticulous around their hand hygiene. My nurses have some problem bringing the bedpan from the room to the macerator or the disinfector. And they're so expensive, so we can't put more than one or two in a, a unit of 44 beds. So did you, do you have any ideas? So, I'm sorry, so I just want to clarify. You're saying that uh, you only keep two bedpans or two No, 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 two units. disinfectors, two okay. machines. Yeah, so what you're getting back to is the transport of the full bedpan yes. to the area of disposal. Yeah. I've been asked that numerous times, and it seems to come up a lot. I know some of the uh, manufacturers have developed bedpans that actually have a little snap-on lid, so you can carry it through the hallways and stuff like that. Um, I think traditionally, even moving a bedpan to a utility room, you run into the same issue. And I think nurses have told me, you generally cover it with something, like a towel, a face cloth. The feedback I'm always getting from industry is they have trouble because the infection control people don't want feces carried through the hallway in case exactly. they drop a bedpan. Well, and I would love to have people email in the horror stories of have you had it in the hallway because to me I would be very very focused on what I was doing if I'm walking with a full bedpan I'm not going to be talking to my neighbor or going down the hallway or peeking into rooms I'm going to be a little bit more focused on getting that bedpan down I've also thought a possible alternative is to use something like a cart that you could put it on uh, that would have to be cleaned afterwards of course but it's just another way of transporting the um, soil pan to an area I think we really need to look at what is the, how many times do people actually drop bedpans and what are the accidents with bedpans because we don't like talking about it. We need to get more of these uh, flusher sanitizers or the macerators into our hospital <coughs> so that we don't have to walk huge distances. But the problem is we're trying to retrofit these into buildings that don't have adequate water, they don't have adequate electricity, they don't have adequate drains to put them as frequently as I would like to see. Jim, thanks again for your time and your talent and your intellectual creativity. Thanks to all the folk at Arjo for their support of this teleclass, and a special thanks to all of you for joining us today. Until we meet again, everybody, goodbye.